All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I believe that some of that food will be left out, so if you want to get some more afterwards, uh, you are more than welcome to. Uh, and uh, if, if you fall asleep because you have food in your stomach, uh, don't worry, I, I won't hold you accountable or anything. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and admit to all of you that this present, presentation in particular, uh, you're going to find that I'm going to be looking at my notes more. Uh, all right, uh, and the reason why is we are going to be talking about uh, the origins of the earth, and there's some material in tonight's presentation that uh, uh, even I uh, had some difficult time understanding. I'm sure that uh, some others here that uh, have a little more experience with science could maybe understand it, but uh, we're going to learn tonight. Is that okay? Let's all learn together, uh, and we're going to have a good time. So we'll go ahead and uh, play this video by Dr. Stan Hudson as he... Uh, uh, introduces us. A couple of presentations ago, we presented the subject of the origin of the oceans. It was there where creationists felt they had a fairly strong case in talking about the Genesis flood, explaining rather well the fossil layers and sedimentary rock that we have in the world. Today, we talk about the origin of the Earth. And we're talking about the age of the Earth and the way that science today uses methods to date the age of rocks. Here is a place where evolutionists feel they have a strong answer, a strong uh, point to make. Right now, we're going to take a look at that evidence, and I'm going to hand everything over once again to our local hosts. And again, thank you so much for coming. All right, fantastic. Uh, so as uh, he mentioned, we'll be looking at the origin of the earth uh, this evening. And uh, uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads for a, a word of prayer, and we will, uh, we will get started. I'm going to go back one in my notes, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, uh, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity that we have to dig into science and into the Bible once again. I pray that you would please be with us. As we look at this uh, very difficult, complicated subject, uh, but Lord, uh, give us uh, uh, your Holy Spirit to help us understand, uh, give us alertness, and we just pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us uh, to come out with a clear picture uh, of your love for us and a better understanding uh, and faith in the Word of God. And we pray these things in your name, amen and amen. Uh, so, I'm going to start off with a, a long scientific quote, uh, but, but hang in there as we try to uh, seek to understand what's being said here. The most widely used mutation rate for non-coding human mitochondrial DNA, there's a handful, relies on estimates of the date when humans and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor. Right, this is speaking from an uh, evolutionist point of view. Taken to be five million years ago. But a few studies, so this is a, a someone who prescribes to the evolutionary theories, uh, they're, they're saying that a few studies have begun to suggest that the actual rates are much faster. Uh, evolutionists are, are most concerned about the effect of faster mutation rate. Researchers have calculated that the mitochondrial Eve Right? In other words, the first mitochondria that started everyone else from an you know, evolution standpoint, they're saying that that first mitochondria only lived 100,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa. Using the new clock, she would be a mere 6,000 years old, which is fascinating. That's from uh, evolutionists. But then, it, we're told at the end, no one thinks that's the case. Remember, we, we talked about worldview that scientists and, and a lot of people, we all do, have a hard time changing our, our models and, and our views. But sometimes uh, our, our models can get in the way of, of, of new data. Uh, and, and as we look at the, uh, at the age of the earth, uh, there's, there's several issues. And we're going to see that there's some issues for creationists. Creationists don't have all the answers and evolutionists don't have all the answers. Uh, but uh, there's, there's some issues that, uh, that we're going to look at. Uh, now, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Archbishop James Usher, um, and he was uh, one of the first that came up with a biblical chronolog uh, chronology, and, and he uh, was a biblical scholar living in the early 1600s, and he even came up with an exact date and even 
time. He believed that God created the world on Sunday, October 29th, 4004 BC, and uh, some of his colleagues said that it was at 9 a.m. That, that God started. So it was very, very uh, uh, precise, but his view, uh, which is generally what uh, creationists uh, 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 view, by and large, a, a short earth rather than long, was held for a number of centuries in Western theology. But then, uh, we've talked about this man before, James uh, Hutton, he's considered to be the father of modern uh, geology, and he proposed, look at that big word in yellow, uniformitarianism. And remember that, that uniformitarianism is the idea that there's processes that have been uniform from the beginning of time, right, evolution, that slowly have been uh, coming this way. And he was the one that proposed that, and he said the Earth's uh, surface has been altered only by current observable processes, not a flood. So there's no, no catastrophes or anything. And he said in his theory of the earth, we find no vestige of a beginning or prospect of an end. So, uh, you know, these big catastrophes were, were, were canceled out of geological science. And people were, you know, starting to, to think, remember, in the 1700s, they wanted to eliminate God from the picture. Um, and during that time period, they were starting to say, well, you know, maybe the earth is a lot longer than we think, according to them. Uh, Charles Lyell, who uh, wrote Principles of Geology, we've talked about him, uh, he imagined the earth to be millions of years old. Uh, and the interesting thing is that he wrote a book about it called Principles of Geology. And guess who had a copy of the Principles of Geology on the HMS Beagle on their trip to the Galapagos Islands? was Darwin. Had a copy of this very book and uh, was being educated by it. Um, now, building on, on Hutton's and Lyle's foundation, William uh, Thompson, who's sometimes called Baron Kelvin, uh, estimated in his mind the age of the earth to be to between 20 and 40 million years old. He was a, a heat loss specialist, and he thought it couldn't be, you know, a, a much older than that because it'd be too cold. You know, in his mind, well, that long ago, you know, it'd be way too cold. No one could live. And so, uh, you know, he was around that, that time period. Uh, next, uh, Ernest uh, Rutherford, he was the father of nuclear physics, and he developed certain experiments like in radioactivity, and he imagined the Earth to be even older uh, than Thompson did. Uh, and so uh, we've traveled, you know, we keep on getting older and older from scientist to scientist, and currently uh, the evolutionary uh, viewpoint uh, is that the Earth is 4 billion uh, years old. Uh, which is uh, certainly a long time ago. Now, uh, we're going to take a look at, at uh, you know, the age of the earth from a creationist standpoint. We're going to look at some, uh, some, some issues uh, from looking at it from this viewpoint. Um, can there be a short earth? Um, and let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the geological columns, right? We talked about that that's the Bible for evolutionists. Um, these layers of, of rock that we find in the earth. And, and according to uh, some scientists, in their minds, it contains inerrant uh, records of, of earth's history. But, but how does one interpret an inerrant record? And if it's inerrant, does that mean that there aren't any uh, problems there? According to this uh, standard view, as we've seen before, uh, the layers of uh, the various geological column uh, show different life forms. And, uh, you know, uh, you have dinosaurs uh, there in the middle in the blue and, uh, you know, all these different layers of, of, of life forms. And along these uh, different uh, areas of life forms, and I know this is kind of small, uh, but you find various uh, things that, uh, that take place. So remember at the very beginning of the geological record, uh, we have 32 out of the 35 life forms appearing. And these are very complicated a uh, animals that are appearing right away, right? Right away there's complicated animals. Um, which is an is a, a interesting thing. Uh, then you find uh, some other different uh, animals that are coming in. Um, you know, people are appearing. Uh, and this is simply talking about uh, the geological column. Um, and according to their view, you know, there's all these millions of years between uh, all these different viewpoints. And we can ask ourselves a question, you know, how do you tell how old a rock is? Right? If you look at a rock and you you know, toss it up and down or, you know, throw it. Uh, it's tough to uh, figure out how old the rock is. Uh, and maybe you uh, recognize this rock here. It'd be, it would be nice if all rocks were, were stamped with an age on it, right? Uh, this is a, uh, someone stamped this with the age uh, 1620. This is Plymouth Rock, to remember the pilgrims in Massachusetts. And the interesting thing is that um, a friend told me that it actually was stamped into the rock in 1880. 
So a couple hundred years later, people went back, um, you know, to stamp that in the rock. So maybe we can't trust, you know, a date that uh, are carved into rocks is what my friend said. And I think uh, that's an accurate uh, statement. Uh, but of course, we don't, we don't have uh, that today. And remember that there's three uh, basic types of rocks. You have sedimentary rocks, you have uh, igneous rocks, and then metamorphic rocks. And does anyone know, uh, what are the only types of rocks that are dateable uh, out of these, uh, according to scientists? Igneous, all right, good. Uh, the igneous uh, rock, um, and uh, uh, they came up with a process of, of dating called radiometric dating. And uh, we're going to look at uh, some assumptions of radio uh, radiometric dating. And these assumptions uh, for this type of dating, all of these have to be in place uh, in order for this to, to, to work. But again, we're going to be looking at uh, some potential issues with this dating uh, method. So one of the first assumptions of radiometric dating is that uh, decay or change rates are constant. And that is how it, it, long it takes for one element to break down into another element, right? Uh, one species to transform into another. And that rate of change has to be constant uh, throughout. You can't affect that rate by heat or pressure or anything like that. Uh, the second uh, assumption of radiometric uh, dating is that initial ratios are known. And if you don't know what that means, uh, don't worry. I don't really either, but that's all right. It says, in other words, with what you're starting off with is your, uh, you're starting off with as you start your clock. So mother and daughter uh, elements um, are what we talked about uh, in just a moment, and this is not making sense at all, uh, but uh, someone else maybe could explain this a little better. Like I said, uh, I, I, I'm certainly not a scientist. Uh, Dr. Lee, do you want to explain what uh, number two is? You think better than me? Sure. They have to know those ratios. Gotcha. So what Dr. Lee said is as they measure rocks, they measure a certain amount of, uh, of C12, carbon-12, and carbon-14, and the ratios between those two, you know, how much are, are located in the rock, uh, need to be known um, in order for them to, uh, to, to date it. Thank you for, uh, for explaining that. Uh, appreciate that. Um, and, and I know he doesn't want me to call him out, but Dr. Lee has been very helpful in this series because uh, I've given him uh, some of the notes and said, hey, help me out with this. Help me explain to this. Uh, he uh, has a little more background, a lot more background in science than, than I do. Um, and then lastly, uh, another assumption of radiometric dating is that uh, rock sample, uh, samples must be chemically and physically isolated in a closed uh, system. In other words, nothing can sneak into that rock or rock layer in that period imagined. Now this, uh, this next part um, uh, is, is going to be a, a probably very difficult. I, I again, uh, don't fully understand the whole half-life. Some of you remember physics and the whole half-life thing from physics. Um, and I, you know, uh, if, you, if you talk to my physics teacher, I never did very well uh, in, in physics. Um, but essentially, you take an element in the form uh, of a mother element, an isotype, and it breaks down into a daughter element, right? Um, and uh, some uh, lose some particles, uh, some become new particles. Um, and the amount of time that it takes for half of the uh, first element, the mother element, all right, to break down into the daughter element is called a half-life. The amount of time it takes is, is called a half-life. Um, and it's, uh, they use this half-life uh, scenario to measure how fast things uh, decay. decay. And the remember, the decay rate has to be uh, constant over time. Uh, so, with carbon-14 dating, uh, this method is used in dating organic materials, things that were once alive, and it measures the ratio of normal uh, carbon to heavy uh, carbon-12 to heavy carbon-14, uh, which has a half-life of 5,730 years. And it cannot be used to get dates in the millions of years, and this is interesting, but it routinely gives dates, uh, and this is the part that maybe is a challenge for some creationists that are older than uh, some of the uh, chronology that we see in the Bible. Uh, now let's ask ourselves two questions. Where does carbon-14 come from, um, and how do they use carbon-14 to interpret dates? Um, so you first of all have a nitrogen form, that little N up there in the atmosphere, and it gets uh, hit by some sort of uh, chemical or a particle, a, a different particle, and it loses some of itself, and it becomes uh, carbon-14, and then carbon-14 is mixed with oxygen. Um, 
and uh, becomes carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide goes into trees and plants. And uh, there's some little critters, and this is a kind of a sad picture, uh, but some uh, critter, critters, like uh, little mice, uh, may eat uh, some of these leaves that have uh, that carbon in it. Um, and then what's left in the body when it dies of carbon-14 goes back to nitrogen-14 time and time again. And the carbon that's left in the body after it goes out into nitrogen is carbon-12. And how much carbon-14 is in the body compared to how much carbon-12 will tell you how long that creature lived. And that gives us identical date. And don't ask me to repeat that. And uh, if you really want to make sense of that, ask uh, Dr. Lee. And I'm sure uh, he could uh, help you a little bit with that. Um, and, and, and the point is, though, here is that, you know, the science, uh, you know, does look good on, on paper. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's not perfect. And we're going to look at that. Now, remember that in uh, radiometric dating, you have to know how much of a mother material that you're starting with. And, and if something happens on Earth that produces uh, carbon-12, for example, like volcanoes ejecting lots of it into the atmosphere, um, then uh, it leads to more kind of that carbon getting into plants or animals, which gives those animals and plants a false reading, right? Uh, if, if more carbon gets released from a catastrophic event like volcanoes, and, the, and that you know, uh, leads to more carbon-12 in plants or animals, then people, when they read those, and scientists read those, then the reading is actually false based on the catastrophe. So I think something that we've learned you know, a lot in this series is that catastrophes really mess with things, right? They, 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 they make things very different. And I think that's very important from our worldview um, you know, to, to remember that, that this uh, you know, idea of uniformitarianism, well, uh, you know, uh, catastrophes change things. And, and, and a lot of uh, scientists are realizing that, you know, when they look at floods in, in Washington, et cetera. Um, exactly, all right? Thank you, Jerry. That's why they're called catastrophes, right? Because they're catastrophic, and they, uh, they change things, and they, they make differences. Um, so notice uh, uh, this quote. Uh, it's interesting, this scientist, uh, his name, uh, Robert Lee. Uh, but he says, the troubles of the radiocarbon dating method are undeniable, deep, and serious. It should be no surprise then that fully half of the dates are rejected. Isn't that interesting? The wonder is surely that the remaining half come to be accepted. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are, are actually selected dates. So, this uh, certain scientist, and this is an older quote from 1981, uh, but, you know, there, there are some... Uh, it seems uh, some, some questions that, that scientists do have about this uh, uh, dating method called carbon dating. Now, let's look at another type of dating called potassium-argon dating. Uh, and this method, you know, carbon dating results in thousands of years. This one does uh, uh, result uh, supposedly in millions of years. Um, and this is, uh, again, where, you know, the rubber meets the road, so to speak, because if this, uh, you know, a dating method uh, is accurate, you know, it does call into question some things that, uh, that we see in the Bible. And we're going to, again, see some, some issues that we see in this uh, dating method. Uh, but essentially, potassium argon's half-life is, is very long, right, compared to carbon. Um, and you can see um, it's uh, very, very long. When hot lava cools into basalt, any argon-40 uh, made afterwards is trapped in the rock. And the ratio of potassium to argon will tell you how long it became uh, solid. And apparently, it takes... Uh, uh, one and one-fourth billion years uh, to, to decay. Um, that's the idea behind this uh, method of dating. Um, now, creationists, uh, obviously we believe that uh, the fossil layers are just a, a few thousand years old. Um, and so, you know, one uh, uh, question that creationists are, are still trying to, you know, figure out is that the lava flows between the fossil layers uh, date, using that uh, dating method, uh, to millions of years. And so how can we, uh, uh, you know, uh, answer that question? And but the good news is that before we give up, there's, there's some challenges uh, to potassium-argon dating uh, that, uh, you know, exist. One is that radiometric dates uh, don't always add up. And we're going to talk about this, so I'm going to go over them now, but we're going to talk about them more in detail. Uh, number two is uh, uh, living fossils. Number three, uh, some missing rocks um, in the geological column, and then fourth, miracles of preservation, and we're going to look at each of those. Um, so, stay with me here, right? Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, numbers. Uh, I'll teach you one thing that's kind of uh, easy. The MY, does anyone know what does the MY stand for? 
It's not my. Millions of years, all right? That's pretty easy, M-Y, all right? Uh, when I read that, I was like, all right, there's hope for this uh, non-scientific brain, right? M-Y is millions of years. So you can see here, 0 0.01 millions of years is, is 10,000 years, because 0 0.01 of a million is, is 10,000. Um, so these are amount of millions of years, but then, the, you know, on the first chart, the last one um, is, you know, uh, 2,600 millions of years. Um, so we're going to talk about this a little in, in just a minute here, right now. So uh, radiometric dating appears to be good science, but uh, where one applies it uh, to actual basalt layers, it can actually undermine the dating method. And here are some data numbers taken from uh, lava flows of a plateau that is uh, in the Grand Canyon. Right? So this is kind of a cutout section, a picture of this plateau, and they look at these different layers in the rock um, to, uh, to, to, to date things. Now, uh, notice that the, there's some differences uh, between these dates. The potassium argon date at the top of the list, right, the 6KR, um, has uh, dates ranging, and that's actually the whole, the whole top one, right, um, has dates ranging from 10,000 uh, all the way to 17 million uh, years old. Um, and, and these are six dates taken from the same uh, uh, flow of lava. Um, now, Here's the interesting thing, is that they noted that there was a lava flow between these different layers, and it should have been older. And they thought that they would date this rock layer using the same methods. But the interesting thing is that they actually came up with dates that were a lot younger. Um, and so, uh, essentially, uh, you know, lava dates, remember that they said that the lava should be, you know, a much older, but they found that some of the lava was actually younger than, than they, they thought it was. Uh, so there was some issues with this radiometric uh, dating. Um, now, here are our locations, and I know uh, there's a large chart here, but here are locations uh, of, of many known lava flows in, in the world today, right? So you have, uh, and notice that uh, a lot of them sound Hawaiian, right, uh, which uh, is interesting, but um, Mount Lassen, you guys know where that one is? Northern That's right, it's uh, here in Northern California. I've been there before, uh, very, very uh, uh, beautiful, and some of these uh, notice that you know, they didn't uh, erupt that long ago. Um, and uh, so we have uh, these, these known lava flows in the world, and, and, and there's a list of dating irregularity, uh, irregularities. In other words, there are lava f these are lava flows where they know when they happen because they had eyewitnesses. But the interesting thing is that when you take the rocks to the lab and date them, they're dated super old, right? Does that make sense? So let's say that Mount Lassen, all right, you know, it goes off in 1950, and there's people, you know, that were alive and recorded that and saw that. But when they take those rocks that erupted in 1950, they're shown to be way, way older. That doesn't make sense, right? If they're erupting right away, why are they uh, much, much older? So there's some huge differences um, in, in age dates. And you can see here uh, what these age differences are, right? So Mount Lassen, you know, was 110,000 years old when really, uh, you know, if they dated it, Right now, it'd only be about 100 years old, right? So why are there these super old dates for these lava flows that are erupting uh, uh, recently? Uh, there are some other issues involving radiometric dating. Uh, here's a tree stump that's encased in some limestone uh, found in England. And the limestone itself, according to this dating, was dated 109 million years old. But the tree stump carbon dated to thousands of years. So how could the limestone be dated to, you know, uh, uh, to millions of years old, but then the tree stump is just uh, thousands of years old? Um, and there's some other, uh, uh, other examples. Another uh, issue for dating the earth is what do you do with, with living fossils? And what we mean by that is this, is that essentially a living fossil, right, is a fossil that was supposedly from millions of years ago, but when you compare it to animals today that are living, they're exactly the same, <laughs> Right? So if an animal like this one, you know, that was, I mean, notice this, uh, it's 400 million years old. That's a very old uh, uh, fish. And for a long time, right, they didn't think that we had this fish. In fact, uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, I'll, I'll pull up these little circles here, um, they saw these uh, bottom fins on the fish, and initially they said, hey, these are, these are feet that are evolving and they're developing. You know, and these feet uh, mean that, that they're transitioning from a fish to, you know, a, an animal or a dinosaur. Um, but the interesting thing 
um, is that rather than this proving that fish walk, you know, uh, on land, uh, they found a fish in 1938, and it was exactly the same, right, uh, as, as this fossil. And this one was caught off the coast of South Africa. The woman pictured here with the fish was a local museum director, and she went down to where the fishermen had caught the fish, and sadly it had already been cleaned or gutted, uh, but the outside was still there, and she told them, she said, hey, listen, if you find any more of these fish, because she knew what was at stake here, if you find any more of these fish, don't gut them, I want to, you know, them uh, uh, whole and complete. Um, and so, they found a lot more of these fish uh, near Madagascar and off the coast of South Africa, and these lower fins are used to swim. They're not used to hop along the ocean floor even, right? They're not even used in the ocean at all uh, to walk on the floor. They're simply used to, to swim. And so, how is it that the fish that they're finding today that are alive are also being found 400 million years ago? There's, there's some issues. Another example of a living uh, fossil is a horseshoe crab. Uh, you can find these around uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, and I've, I've seen one of these on the beach before, up on the East Coast. They're uh, very interesting. Um, and the interesting thing is that they have not changed at all for 400 million years, if that dating is correct. Uh, you know, this uh, Ordovician uh, fossil is 400 million years old, and it looks exactly like a horseshoe crab. Um, so those are, are examples of, of living fossils. Uh, we also see examples of fossils uh, that what appear to, today to be modern animals. Um, and uh, here are some, um, you know, uh, Jurassic fossils or some bugs from, uh, from Germany. And again, these are, you know, 150 million years old, but uh, that looks a lot like a shrimp. It looks a lot like a dragonfly uh, to me. Um, so maybe they're not uh, that old after all. Another example of living fossils uh, was found at this uh, national park in Australia, about uh, 90 miles so, uh, northwest of Sydney. And here's a picture of uh, a gentleman named Dave Noble. He was a young Australian ranger who was working for the park service. And he told us, uh, his supervisor that he wanted to go into the park and uh, do some survey uh, of, of a canyon that was only accessible by rope. Um, and no one really had spent much time in this canyon before, so he went in. And the interesting thing is that he ended up coming out with information about a tree that no one had ever seen before. So he went into a canyon that was only as accessible by a rope, and he came out with information, pictures about this tree that no one had ever seen before. And what uh, David had discovered was the uh, Wolemi Pines. And the interesting thing is that previous to uh, Mr. Noble finding these, they were only known in the fossil record supposedly 200 million years old. So this particular type of tree, they had never seen before. The only time they'd seen it was in the fossil record. Oh, that was from 200 million years ago, and we just found it in, in Australia. Um, so another example uh, of a, a living fossil. Uh, we showed you uh, some of these footprints um, in our 6 o'clock uh, presentation. We talked... Uh, about dinosaurs, uh, but they found footprints with uh, shape that was identical to modern birds in this uh, Triassic layer of a rock in Argentina. Um, but the interesting thing is that they were uh, 55 million years old when they thought it was too early for, for birds. Um, and so they found these birds way earlier than they thought birds even existed um, in, in this uh, geological column. Uh, another issue for dating the Earth uh, is called uh, missing rock. And uh, this is what we would call unconformities. Um, and sometimes we find, uh, in the layers of rocks, we find gaps. If, if this whole you know, theory is true, that there's, there's millions of years between every layer, uh, we find some, uh, some gaps in that. And the great uh, unconformity can found, be found at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And uh, uh, below the yellow arrows is bedrock, which is supposedly billions of years old. And yet between the bedrock and where you see the layers starting is a missing time period of a billion years. So how do you explain this missing time gap of a billion years uh, in the geological column? It's not easy to explain. Another uh, issue is miracles of preservation. Uh, and we talked about this uh, from our dinosaur discussion involving the T-Rex bones. Uh, but since 2005, scientists... Uh, when they've studied the inside of a T-Rex bone, they've actually found uh, proteins. Um, and proteins from these bones have been found in Triceratops, a duck-billed dinosaur, dinosaur eggs from uh, Argentina, an embryonic uh, seropod from China. 
uh, and all these uh, other uh, different uh, animals, they've actually found, you know, a, a soft tissue and proteins uh, in them, uh, which maybe, uh, again, they're not quite as old as, as people have, have thought. Um, now, we've also been told that, generally speaking, uh, it takes millions of years uh, for things like, like coal and petrification and stalactites and opal and, and oil, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to form. Uh, but uh, we found that a lot of these uh, materials can actually be formed in, in, in a short period of time. And I'll give you a couple of, of examples. Um, if you go to Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone, you'll see ca uh, calcium uh, carbonate forming rocks uh, as you're there, right? So you see calcinate carbonate uh, literally forming rocks uh, wa while you're watching it. Um, and you can see the mineral-rich uh, waters creep over and start to cover the legs of this observation uh, platform with new rock. So, you know, there's, like in Yellowstone, there's processes where, you know, I used to think, well, this is taking millions of years, but we're being shown that these things can happen a lot more quickly than people have thought. Um, in addition, uh, calcium carbonate is very uh, instrumental in uh, stalactites uh, growing. And how many of you have ever been to a cave before? Uh, uh, I have, um, I remember when we lived in Tennessee, we used to go to uh, one of the biggest caves in the world, which is in Kentucky, um, and absolutely beautiful, beautiful uh, place. Um, just this uh, past summer, actually, uh, there was a really interesting uh, cave uh, that I went to with my kids uh, up in Washington uh, State, and we were visiting there with uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, family. And we went to uh, these caves that were formed from underground uh, lava flows. Um, and these underground uh, lava flows eventually uh, uh, cooled and left these uh, caves. And, you know, it settled down and left these massive caves there. Um, and so it's always interesting, you know, to go into a cave and turn off the lights for a kid. And, you know, it's completely dark. Um, but in addition, you know, uh, a lot of caves, um, like Mammoth Caves back in uh, Kentucky, have these stalactites that, that uh, previously thought, you know, uh, uh, took millions of, of years to make. And these, uh, this particular uh, picture is from Carlsbad Caverns, and if you uh, go there, uh, they say, not millions, but they take hundreds of thousands of, of years to make, they say. Um, but the interesting thing is that if you take a slice, right, of this stalactite here, you can see these rings of growth. Do you see that? There's these rings up here. And notice this, uh, this large uh, uh, center piece, um, and, and it seems that the growth Right? You had this large centerpiece that happened very quickly, and then you have the, the, the growth on the outside. So basically, you know, uh, they're showing that in very minerally saturated hot water, you can make these very quickly. Um, and it doesn't take uh, hundreds of thousands of years after all. Um, there's an interesting, uh, interesting observation made about Carlsbad ca uh, Caverns, and this is by a cave specialist, Jerry Trout. It says, from 1924 to 1988, there was a visitor sign above the entrance to Carlsbad Caverns that said, Carlsbad was at least 260 million years old. Well, in 1988, the sign was changed to read 7 to 10 million years old. Then for a little while, the sign read that it was 2 million years old, and now the sign is gone. <laughs> so they're realizing again, and we all change our minds, right? Uh, you know, when we look at further evidence, um, and, and I want to say this, um, and I hope that I haven't come across this way at all, uh, but I think it's so important when we have these discussions in general to admit our weaknesses, but also to show our strengths, right? Uh, because every uh, viewpoint does have weaknesses. And like we said, creationists don't have all the answers, but there's enough solid answers, and I have the Bible that I'm solidly a creationist, right? There's no problem at all. I mean, praise God that I believe before Jesus comes, creationists are going to find more and more evidence, right? Uh, because uh, it's true. Um, uh, but we obviously need to have these discussions uh, with kindness. Now, we've mentioned this uh, u word before, uniformitarianism, um, and if we use this model of everything continues at the same rate, uh, we also have problems applying to other known pro uh, uh, processes. And some of those include, I know there's a, a big list here, right, uh, but, uh, you know, if you follow this pro uh, process, uh, some of the problems are you have carbon-14 in wrong places, we talked about that, you have erosion of continents, decay of comets, lack of sediment in oceans, Lack of salt in oceans, um, you know, Earth's magnetic field rate of decay, too much helium in rocks, retreat of moon from the Earth, agri uh, agriculture is too recent, too few human remains, biological remains declay too quickly, human population size. You know, there's issues that, uh, that come up uh, with 
these uh, uh, various, uh, or with the standard model. And, and specifically with the erosion of, of contents, if the erosion of contents, uh, continents, excuse me, if the erosion of continents at our current known rate is applied over the evolutionary time, then our continents would have eroded several times over in Earth's history, which is interesting, right? So if you apply, we know now how long it takes for continents to erode, right? And if you apply that millions of years, like evolution says, then over and over, right, they should be uh, eroding several more times than they are, which, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at um, what uh, some of these uh, scientists said. Um, and is that uh, uh, video uh, not in there, Stan? Yeah, the next one. It's the next one. Okay, sounds good. One of the greatest questions in the subject of origins has to do with how old life is on planet Earth. Evolutionists tend to think billions of years. Creationists tend to think thousands of years. Some of this boils down to the subject of how old are the rocks. Now, when we date igneous rocks like lava here at the Kilauea volcano on the island of Hawaii, we find out that there's potassium, a metalloid, and argon, a gas. And how long it takes for potassium to break down in argon is a way of determining how old the lava is. So let's take a look now at these methods of dating and take a look and see how reliable they might be. In my view, what is the biggest challenge for a creationist model scientifically. I would say probably the issue of dating, uh, the issue of um, the age that is attributed to rocks formations or the time that is actually required for particular geological processes to occur. Therefore, um, that area I think still presents a lot of um, challenges and um, it's something that we need to study and uh, we are in interested in understanding more. Well, radiometric dating actually is a group of dating methods. Uh, it's not a single method. Uh, it basically is trying to use radioactive elements. Those are elements who are gradually changing into some other element and using that to measure how long, uh, how much time has passed. Um, you could think of it sort of like an hourglass. And in fact, uh, people from many different perspectives have used that illustration. Uh, the hourglass starts out with parent element at the top, and then it runs through a small area which uh, allows a measured amount of parent element to change into daughter element at the bottom. And if you measure the amount of parent element and you measure the amount of daughter element, you might get a time out of it. Now, of course, there are all kinds of problems with that. One of them is that you don't know for sure always exactly how much parent element you started out with. Um, so one of the questions is, the, uh, ha has the carbon-14 in the atmosphere been constant over time? And in fact, it has not. They, everybody recognizes that it's, it's varied. Um, so that depends on the amount of cosmic rays that hit the atmosphere. It's related to the Earth's magnetic field, the shielding from the cosmic rays. Um, and so the carbon-14 community has developed methods of calibrating using tree rings and, and other methods to estimate what the true age is in comparison with the carbon-14 age. Um, and so carbon-14 is generally accepted by everybody to work quite well for the last few thousand years. The further you go back, the, the more uncertainty there is based on, on the calibrations. 
Um, the radiometric ages are often diff very difficult for me to understand in a short time frame. Um, I've re recently written a book chapter that kind of outlines my approach to these things. And as I work with these ages, as a person who believes in the Bible, I've kind of summarized the way I deal with it under six points. Uh, one is I look at the history of science and see that science developed within a Christian framework in Western Europe. And the first scientists, the fathers of science, were Bible-believing Christians. So I believe that it's possible to um, see God as creator and do good science as I look at his creation in the context of the founding fathers of science. Second, I um, look at what the big issue is. For me, the big issue is that God is a good and a powerful God. And like Charles Darwin, I have a problem seeing that this good God would specifically create the evil I see in the world and in nature. And I think that God wants to get the bad stuff over as quickly as possible. So the bad stuff will only be there for a limited amount of time. Um, third, I um, am anxious to do good science. Uh, so as I do my scientific research, I realize I'm studying God's creation and I'm very careful with the data and not making claims from the data that cannot be supported. Fourth, as I look at the Genesis record, I find evidence for changes in rates. I find the evidence for water being a major geological factor. Um, and therefore, as I do my geology research, I'm looking for evidence for changes in rates of geological processes, the effects of water uh, on the processes I'm working on. Uh, the fifth and probably one of the overarching pictures that I use is I recognize my own human limitations, that God is so much greater than I, I am, that he has a thousand ways to do things that I don't know anything about. And although I feel like evidence and reason is extremely important, I realize that there needs to be more than that, and, and God has many ways Amen. to do things. And finally, number six, as I am working on understanding the natural world, and as I'm working on understanding on how it's related to the Bible, I find it very important to treat people well. And it's easy to denigrate people on one side or another, but I don't find that to be helpful. Amen. Sometimes I don't do a very good job of living up to that goal, but I do find that to be very important that I treat people well, both the people that I agree with and the people that I may not agree with. So radiometric dating is a difficult topic, but um, I found that these six guidelines help me in knowing how to deal with some of the difficulties. So what these rocks are doing is what all igneous rocks are doing. In fact, we might say all of creation in a way, as we are all seeing movement toward decay. Rocks are decaying. And why is that? If you have an old Geiger counter, you can pick up the ticks, the radioactivity of some kinds of rocks. Those rocks are decaying. That's why you get those clicks. So what is it about our creation that is decaying? Why is it going uh, apart, falling apart? Let's take a look in the Bible and see if we can find answers for the origins of decay. Fantastic, uh, fantastic. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate that last scientist said uh, we don't have all the answers, uh, but we have uh, enough that we can continue to have faith in God. Amen. So uh, Genesis, the book of beginnings, is unusually interested in chronology with the different ways that it lists its generations. Um, 
and, and, and it seems, uh, you know, very uh, interested in, 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 in dates. And one question as it relates to these genealogies is, are they looking backward or pointing forward? As they relate to time, prophetic scripture is more concerned about who is coming than what has been. God's uh, word is a reflection uh, of him. And so Genesis, as the first uh, chapter in the Bible, uh, gives us a, a, a nice uh, sketch uh, of what God is, is going to do. And let's uh, take a look at that again. So uh, you can look at the very bottom of the screen and see that the Bible says, uh, and forgive me, I'm going to uh, go back there. There we go. Click the wrong button. It says, the earth was without form and void. And those two uh, Hebrew words, without fo uh, form and void, are tohu and bohu, right? Uh, very uh, interesting words. One means unformed, the other means unfilled. And uh, in the Hebrew way of, of writing, uh, these interesting words actually provide the framework for, for creation. And God organizes his days of creation um, into these different unformed and unfilled uh, uh, ways. So, for example, uh, day one, right, he creates the heavens, and then day four, he fills the heavens with things, right? They're unformed, and they're, but then they, he fills them, right? The sky and the sea, he fills them with birds and fish. The dry land, he fills with, with animals and man. And perhaps uh, we can, uh, we, we've seen this uh, uh, format before, uh, but... Uh, what's interesting about the, this format, as you look in creation, is particularly the last day, the seventh day. Uh, because every single other day of creation um, has, has a purpose, right? The sun and moon are filling the heavens, and the birds and fish are filling the sky and sea, and animals and man are filling the dry land. But this last day, where does it fit uh, into this uh, uh, categories uh, that, that he has? And, and, and I think that... If the Sabbath is one of the forms, he fills the Sabbath with himself, right? If we were to list the, the, the Sabbath on the left-hand side um, as one of the forms, what would he fill the Sabbath with? And he fills it uh, with himself. The Sabbath is all about uh, a celebration of spending uh, time with our Maker. And so time obviously came from our Creator, right? And I think this was mentioned, but, you know, one day with God is a thousand years. So even though we might not fully understand all the timing uh, on our earth, uh, I am confident uh, of a, a short uh, age of, of our earth because uh, there is evidence and also the Bible uh, makes that uh, very clear. Uh, so the question uh, here on the screen is why did it take God six days uh, uh, to create the earth, right? Why six full days? Because he could have, you know, uh, just in the very beginning, he could have said, let it be. And there it was. But why did he... Uh, uh, you know, create this, this rhythm. Um, and one interesting thing that I know a lot of us uh, who are Sabbath keepers, and if you're not a Sabbath keeper, uh, this may be new to you, which is no problem. Um, but uh, there's a lot of different uh, things uh, in astronomy that help uh, govern uh, our different time periods, right? Uh, you know, uh, the day, right, is uh, the 24 hours, right, that the, uh, that the earth is spinning. And the month is related to the moon, the 365 days is the amount of time that it takes to go around the sun. Uh, so all of these things that we have in our calendar, the year, the day, the month, all have to do with uh, processes that are happening um, in astronomy. What about the week? You know, uh, what happens uh, uh, during, you know, do we have our moon going around our planet during the week? No, what, what happens every seven days in the solar system? And the answer is, is nothing, right? God is the one that gives us this week. And we get this week from the biblical record. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So God is very interested in time. Um, and uh, that's, I think, really, when we look at the, the age of the earth and we look at time, at the end of the day, God uh, is a God of time. He's a God of, of, of order. And he made this 24 hours to spend with him. And I'm so thankful that we have the Sabbath as a, a weekly memorial and celebration of, of creation. But, as we know, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of sin, uh, that beautiful thing that God made uh, was, was marred, and it lost much of its uh, original uh, uh, beauty. And things became more complex, 
And things, uh, uh, unfortunately, because of sin, uh, as we talked about, even animal species uh, got, got more uh, disorderly or, or, or wicked. Um, but as those scientists mentioned, that disorder and that sin is temporary. I'm so glad that the evil in our world is temporary. Amen? It's not going to last forever. And we see a lot of decay happening around us. Uh, but I'm so thankful that it's not going to be forever. You know, uh, it's funny as I was... Uh, reflecting on this, I was thinking about uh, my son Judah, and uh, Judah in particular, out of all my children, for whatever reason, has a heart for, for animals. All of my kids love animals, but, you know, Eden as a little baby, she's not afraid to like, oh, there's an ant, you know, step on it, right? Um, or, you know, a little uh, cricket, like, squish between my fingers, and often, you know, Judah will catch a, a smallest little bug, even an ant, you know? And he'll be showing it to us, and, Dad, look at this, look at this. And, you know, Eden wants to come over and squish it. And there's been several times where, uh, you know, uh, Eden, you know, might accidentally squish, you know, a, a bug that Judah's holding, and he just starts just weeping. You know, he's so sad over the loss of life. And, 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 and to me, as a parent, that's, there's so much beauty in that, because I, I think all of us, you know, we see, when we see decay, and we see the loss of life, and we you know, see a, a flower, you know, that's dead or, or leaves that are falling. You know, uh, there's a part of us that's sad because God didn't create us for decay. He created us for life. And I'm so thankful that there is one millions and billions of year time period that I know to be true. And that is when we get to heaven, eternal life, all right? When we look forward, there's going to be millions and billions of years uh, that are going to go on for eternity. And that's the millions and billions of years that I'm looking forward to. Uh, you know, unfortunately, um, uh, as was mentioned, our, our creation was subjected to, uh, to uh, uh, corruption. I just want to read the last part of this verse. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, but it says, We know that the whole creation groans and, and labors. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, our, our world is, is, you know, Isaiah says that it, um, you know, is, is uh, being burdened by, by the weight, right, of, of, of everything that's happening. And, and our world is, you know, uh, recognizing that, uh, you know, it's groaning with, with the, 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 the decay and sin that, that, that's on it. But thankfully, uh, God is going to uh, uh, take care of that uh, very, very soon. Notice this verse, Romans uh, 8, 26. It says, for we uh, do not know, uh, we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. You know, we don't always know what to pray for. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings. And that's that same word there. When it says creation groans, the Holy Spirit groans for us. Isn't that a beautiful thing? He, he longs for the decaying people on planet Earth to be with Him. Um, and that's why the Bible says, uh, says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on Earth. This world is not our home. It's decaying. You know, we see that. Uh, you know, that this world is, is slowly uh, passing uh, on, but this world is not our home. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy. And that is truly uh, what we can all look forward to, uh, is the day when there'll be no more time, we'll be able to study science forever. I'm excited about getting to heaven and asking God all these questions. Lord, explain to me carbon dating, what's going on here, and explain to me, you know, all this. We're going to be studying that for eternity. And the best science that we'll be studying is the science of salvation. The science of redemption. That's the true science that we're going to be looking at and studying it. How in the world can a God of love leave everything behind, become a sinful being that he created, uh, and die on a cross for our sins? Absolutely amazing. And that truly is the science that uh, we can look forward to studying for a, a long time after this. Uh, so let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, uh, I want to thank you so much, Lord, for... The little bit that hopefully we're able to learn tonight, uh, knowing that, uh, Lord, uh, we don't have all the answers, but you do. And I'm so thankful for that, Lord. And, and Lord, in my uh, finite mind, uh, creationism, Lord, gives me uh, so much uh, hope and beauty and purpose. And more than that, Lord, uh, uh, I, I see that, that it makes sense, that, that, that it helps us understand processes um, today. And, and I thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that each person here, as, as we leave, would go home with a hope, knowing that though things are decaying on, on planet Earth, you aren't. Uh, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You never change. And we long for the day where we get to see you face to face. 
Uh, we love you. Thank you for loving us first, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, well, we have one last presentation. One more. And that is tomorrow night we're going to talk about the origin of the universe. We're going to talk about the Big Bang and, and uh, all that good stuff. Uh, so we'll end tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Uh, origin of the universe tomorrow at 7 p.m. Just one last presentation. Encourage those who are watching online to come back tomorrow and those that are here to come in person tomorrow as well. God bless you. Have a great night. And we'll see you tomorrow. Come quick.